Uh, good evening, one and all. Today we will be discussing uh, DALC, the basic surgical steps, indications, instruments, investigations, advantages, and disadvantages. So, looking at the evolution of DALC, the first lamellar surgery was postulated by Von Walther and uh, Mulhaber, pioneered by author Von Hippel in, uh, as old as 1877. The use of LK was, however, reserved for technonic indications and was less than 2% of transplants uh, performed till almost 2009. It has now re-emerged due to technical improvements in surgical techniques and advances in the eye bank technology. So looking at types of anterior lamellar keratoplasty as such, it can be superficial lamellar keratoplasty or SALK, where it is only up to 160 microns, uh, mid anterior lamellar or MALK, where it is about 160 to 400 microns depth, uh, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty, uh, more than 4, 400 up to the decimates, and when the it is called total anterior lamellar keratoplasty or decimatic dalk when almost the uh, entire DM is barred. Majority of the corneal tissue is removed in dalk, leaving behind decimates membrane and the corneal endothelium before suturing a donor corneal graft, which is devoid of DM. Uh, so it is an alternative to PK in patients who have a healthy endothelium. So the patient having a healthy endothelium is the most important criteria to perform a DAL. So investigations that we need to perform before deciding or choosing a patient to proceed with DAL. So slit lump examination, pachymetry, ASOCT and pentacam. So yeah. can anybody tell why each one is important? Yeah, Shweta, you can ask somebody directly because nobody will uh, volunteer. So you can start off. So who's there uh, amongst the senior residents? Anybody is there? So the lamp examination is done to assess the depth of scar, corneal scar, and uh, pathometry to assess uh, what is the thickness of stomal bed, like in advanced keratoconus and uh, in dystrophy. Space OCT uh, to assess the level of scarring, and a pentacam to assess the regularity of the surface. So how does how does uh, say if, if if a packy is 150 in keratoconus thinnest packy, how does it make a difference? Uh, so the pack, uh, according to one study, sir, star depth by. Uh, I am not talking about star. I am not. I am not talking about star. I told you a packy is of. Uh, an advanced keratoconus is 160 or 170 microns. How does it change your decision? Does it change your decision to do a dial versus a PK? There is no scar. It's only a thin advanced keratoconus. Uh, no, sir. We can proceed with manual. So then why do you need PK? More importantly, in DALC, what we are looking at is if you have, uh, in terms of keratoconus, I'll finish and then we'll go on to why we mentioned pachymetry here. So if you're looking at keratoconus and you're looking at a very thin cornea, you are not actually looking at the thickness in the thinnest point, except when you are peeling, once you, when you do trying to do a big bubble dalk, you, the first step after either initiating the bubble or even before initiating the bubble is removal of the superficial cornea. So you end up having less thickness for you to cut after you get the big bubble. So if you have a very, very thin cornea in the FX, you can just leave that area because when you try to, uh, peel off the tissue in that area, you might end up having an inadvertent, pro either an inadvertent perforation or you might inadvertently open up the bubble, which will then make it difficult for you to recreate the space. So if you have a very thin advanced keratoconus and the superficial layer that you're removing, you can remove it all around except in that area, which is maximally thin because there it is already 160. So you, you, you can easily cut it with one as once you puncture your bubble. The reason for debulking is it becomes thinner. So when you're using one as to cut it, it becomes easier for you to cut the residual uh, bed. So if you're dealing with a very thin cornea, you want to limit your superficial initial peel off of the corneal stroma to uh, to not dissect it in that area of the coat. The pachymetry, role of pachymetry more in DALC in general is if you expect a scar, you expect the cornea to be thinner. If you have a scar, but the cornea is still thicker, that indicates that your endothelial cell is not as healthy. So, especially in terms of, say, a viral keratitis, which has recurrent viral keratitis and a scar. So, with scar, there is a compaction of cornea. So, if after having a scar, you are seeing a packy of 600, then you know that probably the endothelium is not healthy. It doesn't preclude you from doing a DALC. You can still go ahead with it. But both you and the patient need to be aware that there is a possibility 
that visual outcome might be suboptimal or he might need a pk subsequently or some form of an ek subsequently if the residual endothelium fails to clear your cornea so the idea is to know or give you an idea how your residual endothelial cells could probably be functioning coming to asoct and pentacan uh, sunita said regularity of surface regularity of surface is not that much critical because you are anyway going to change the surface whether with pentacam or with oct what you want is you want to know what is the trephination depth and if you are going to be doing an 8 mm graft or you are going to be doing a 7.5 mm graft or you are going to be doing a 9 mm graft you need to know the thickness in that area so your predetermined depth could be at least 75 to 80% of your pachymetric value in that zone so either you use pentacam for it or you use oct for it it gives you an idea that yes your 8 mm has a thickness of 400 microns or 450 microns so you can safely dissect a 300 micron initial group so your surgery becomes a lot more easier because even if you don't get a big bubble you know you are within 100 microns or 150 microns of your intended depth uh, in terms of your uh, dm the role of oct and pentacam in terms of scar is more is more specifically with respect to the depth of the scar is more with respect to superficial lamellar keratoplasty is where if you are going to be using femtosecond or a micro keratom assisted uh, lk you know the depth of the scar and you can decide on the on your depth of your femto cut based on the depth of the scar now if you have an oct which shows your scar is uh, involving the dm in terms of the report do you consider dalk or do you consider pk a pk or might pk? need to be considered because if it if the scar is involving the desmets then the separation of the desmets might not happen how how good is your resolution can you clearly demarcate the desmets from the posterior corneal stroma on oct when you look at a normal oct you cannot so no. just by a scattering of light on the oct doesn't tell you that your dm is involved we are resolution is not so good to say that we will not do a dalk just because the oct shows a, a near full thickness scar once you peel off once you go deeper you might be able to get a big bubble you will be able to peel it off if you have a very faint haze of the dm also you might still get away because the vision might get better this is the phase where your pachymetry is going to play a role so if your pachy is normal and you have a reasonably full thickness scar you might still go, go ahead and do a dalk if your pachy is 650 or 630 and you have a near full thickness uh, scar on your oct then i would think that i might want to go for a pk because the residual endothelium in that area is not functioning as well for me to leave it your oct depth of scar doesn't tell you whether the desmet is involved in the scar or not it doesn't give us that uh, resolution uh, as such that was uh, the other thing was um, with lamp we finished the uh, yeah. the next thing is with lamp when you are doing a patient with uh, keratoconus it is very difficult for you to identify the cone intraop surgically in terms of the fleissures ring is not seen as as well so if you are dealing with a keratoconus patient and you are seeing a fleissures ring because you need to cover the fleissures ring in your graft you can document the diameter of the ring and you can document the distance from the limbus it is 2 mm from the inferior limbus 4 mm from the temporal limbus 3 mm from the nasal limbus under the under the microscope it is very difficult for you to identify the fleissures ring unless you have some pictorial uh, clue that gives you where that ring is uh, is going to be because you need to encompass that so either do it that way or uh, you will have to uh, look at your pentacam images which will give you an idea about the uh, cone uh, size based on your pachymetric uh, map uh, and your steepness which will tell you but it is always good to mark the distance of your fleissures ring from the limbus to be sure pre op itself what is going to be your diameter of trephine that you are going to use what is going to be the depth of trephine that you are going to be use so you are, you are prepared before you sit for your uh, case yeah proceed so slit lamp examination to measure like sir had said the pre op to determine where the cone uh, is or mark the fleissures and also to assess the depth of lesion pachymetry to design on the technique uh, asoct depth of corneal involvement state of the endothelium and also sometimes intraoperatively so what are the indications of dark 
it can be categorized as therapeutic tectonic optical and uh, sometimes cosmetic indication as well therapeutic in an infectious corneal ulcer scar or an ulcer itself tectonic focal or diffuse ectasia like in a pmd or post pk it can be an autoimmune neurotrophic or infectious melt small traumatic perforation or desmetoceles uh, peripheral corneal thinning as in morens uh, terians or collagen vascular disorders benign lesions or uh, pterygium or dermoid in optical indications the main purpose would be to remove the op opacity irregularity and also the restoration of contour so primary stromal diseases like uh, keratoconus stromal dystrophies or degenerations but here never involving the endothelium uh, corneal dermoids can also be uh, an optical indication post traumatic or post infection opacities one second so which therapeutic case you would not do a dalk you uh, you want to do a keratoplasty for a patient because it's advanced uh, infective keratitis which are the indications where uh, for an infective keratitis where dalk has good outcomes what are the case infections where you would not want to do dalk and why uh, when the infections are uh, involving the anterior stromal yeah, you have a large ulcer you have a large ulcer you planning for a for an for a therapeutic there are certain indications where you would as an indication you say that yes dalk can be done and there are certain indications where you say you would not want to do a dalk which infection etiology you would want to do a dalk which infection or an etiology cause you would probably not want to do a dalk why because not the spread of infection will be along the corneal nerves so you are anyway removing it so whether you do pk whether you do a dalk the spread along the nerves is not an issue uh it generally doesn't go in through the dm into the anterior chamber so you you can if you get a good big bubble you can do dalk for acanthamoeba keratitis the results with dalk are reasonably good as far as acanthamoeba is concerned bacterial if you feel it is not responding to medications you can consider it but generally bacterial tends to respond to some medication so you probably might not need to do a dalk in most of the bacterial cases microsporidiosis again you would probably want to avoid a dalk because you might want to do a pk the outcomes with pk is pretty much good you don't have too much of medications for microsporidiosis so you don't want to be inadvertently touching the uh, touching the, the stroma at some place of dissection and transplanting the uh, cysts to the other uh, residual bed so it might be easier to just do a clean pk so microsporidiosis probably and more importantly fungal is is an indication where you would not want to do a dalk the incidence of recurrence in the residual bed is much higher so if you have a therapeutic indication for a dalk most likely it's going to be for acanthamoeba followed by bacterial fungal would probably be the last and i would probably want to avoid unless i'm absolutely certain my infiltrate is above the um, the area that i'm dissecting again when you are doing a therapeutic dalk unlike an optical dalk where you can go layer by layer you want to go as deep as possible because you don't want to be touching the infected area with the instrument and then needing the infection in other areas of the cornea so you would want a big bubble you would want to rupture the big bubble and then dissect it rather than do a layer by layer dissection which is which is fine as far as an optical process is concerned but uh, the risk of seeding the uh, bug in a different area of the cornea is much higher if you do it in an infective situation so what are the advantages of dalk over pk the recipient's own healthy endothelium is retained which means less uh, endothelial cell attrition and lesser chances of rejection uh, tectonic strength is maintained because of the dissimmetric membrane integrity and lesser intraocular surgery com uh, complications and we do not have the risk of uh, spreading uh, the infection intraocularly because the endothelium is still present lesser requirement of immunosuppression and uh, component utilization of grafts where a single donor uh, two surgeries is possible Uh, chronic steroid use reduction hence uh, lesser chance of secondary complications like glaucoma and it allows usage of a larger graft up to even 9 to 11 mm disadvantages would be its time consuming requires a skill set uh, interface irregularity uh, in case of keratoconus and surface epithelial problems in the immediate post op period more prominent graft hose junction scar due to reduced steroids so various techniques have evolved over a period of time for preparing the donor tissue itself initially the, uh, a manual trephine was used to control the incision depth later there was micrometric depth regulator to prepare the lenticule then microkeratome for both the donor and recipient corneas were used 
now we use the halamans concept where the, only the decimate is stripped uh, a suction refine uh, which is vacuum assisted or a free hand posterior punch standard either can be used in preparing the donor uh, coming to the instruments we have uh, some instruments common to other keratoplasty such as the crescent knife the right left corneal scissors the 15 degree side port teflon block artificial uh, anterior chamber banas uh, the tying forceps Lynn's or Hoskins forceps. The vacuum trifine, Hesburg Baron uh, vacuum trifine, it's a disposable trifine. Uh, it is fixed on the cornea first, the initial clip, which has the finger grips and the vacuum body. So there is no chance of slippage. And after that, the trifine can be used. And each rotation, the blade is lowered to about 60 microns. So depending on the pachymetry that we have, we can determine the depth up to which the trifine can be, uh, the number of revolutions can be thought about. This is what we have, a vacuum assisted one, where this is fixed on the patient's cornea. And then uh, depending upon the size, the trifine can be used. Yeah, um, just, just a minute. So basically there are, if you're looking at vacuum assisted trifines for DALC, you have the suction trifines which uh, you can you have the donor and the recipient suction trifines so this is the recipient uh, suction trifine where you ask your sister or your assistant to keep the uh, keep the plunger down you place the um, uh, your uh, trifine center it on the area that you want and then she releases the syringe so some amount of suction is generated you don't want too much of a suction at the same time you don't want too less of a suction so once the suction is adequate then every rotation every quarter turn gives you about 60 microns as far as asberg baron is concerned we have a similar one with coronet coronet again uh, the company doesn't state the amount of uh, which is this is coronet it doesn't give you what is the amount of rotation that it uh, does but it's somewhere close to around 70 microns but it's not published anywhere on an average you take 60 to 70 microns so if you have a peripheral uh, uh, thickness say of 450 microns you are looking at maybe around six or seven uh, quarter turns of your uh, trifine to reach to a reasonably deep thing the success of getting a big bubble to a large extent depends on how good your initial depth is going to be if you are reasonably deep not just uh, achieving a big bubble even if the big bubble fails you have very good vertical edges of your uh, trifine which makes it easy for a proper uh, opposition of your donor lenticule to the recipient uh, bed. The, just go back to the previous uh, photo. So this is something which is again come from uh, Coronet, uh, from, uh, uh, Coronet where uh, you have the standard, these are individual. So instead of having to rotate, you have these guarded trifines which could be 300 micron, 400 micron, 450 micron. Now you can use these guarded trifines directly also like we do in a normal trifine, but the only problem is sometimes it slips. When you are holding the eye and you try to rotate it, it can slip. So to avoid that, you have this kind of a suction attachment where you can place it on the cornea. So now you have your uh, ring centered on it, then you place your guarded trifine and you rotate it because you've already checked your previous pachymetric value. You know whatever is the amount of force that you're using, this trifine is not going to go beyond the 300 microns that uh, is there. So to that extent, it's a lot more safer than using the uh, Hasberg Baron because there, the first time used, it's fine. But if you're going to reuse it, you can open it up, sterilize it and reuse it. When you reuse it, you have to be absolutely certain that you are placing it in the correct starting point. Because if you have placed your blades down, that means even when you're placing it before the first rotation itself, it has cut some amount of tissue. Or if you place the blade up, you might have to rotate more number of turns for you to actually cut the required uh, depth of your tissue. Here, those parameters are not there. You just place your suction ring and you place your theorem micron guarded trifine and you rotate it, you will get nice vertical edges. We'll have a video about, about this later. So we have both the, the um, coronet suction trifines and the guarded trifines that we can use for DALC uh, dissections. Yeah, go on. And we also have handheld disposable non-vacuum corneal trifines. Uh, the, the sizes were from 0.25 uh, millimeters to 0.5 size increments. Uh, this is the diamond knife. This also has a rotation that is possible in the end. So basically, that either a diamond knife or or um, a customized blade. So if you don't have guarded trifines, you can use your standard trifines. You can trifine a little bit. You want to be sure that you've gone at least up to 300 microns. You can use the guarded knife to kind of make 
a groove at least for that one quadrant of uh, your cornea so you are you are sure at least that you are uh, so deep again the uh, the diamond knife is sharp the garnet refines from uh, madhu um, and from joja are not as sharp the 300 micron blades are not as sharp you might still it might just give you a starting point you might still need to use your uh, 15 degree knife to kind of go deeper and and have a visible clue as to how thick your uh, anterior stroma is before you start doing your dissection uh, as such but these are ideas to reach at least close to 300 microns or more when you are starting with your uh, dissection this is a 300 micron guarded microsurgical knife this can be used to make the initial groove to reach the uh, depth some surgeons have devised their own set of uh, dark instruments anwar had his own uh, fogla had his own so the set of instruments that we have is a 27 gauge uh, pointed dissector uh, uh, air injection cannula and a trifacetic spatula which uh, aids in the uh, dissection through the stromal layers and so that this trifacetic spatula aids in easier cutting of the tissue on top uh, rather than when it slips when used on a flat spatula and we also have the corneal scissors right and left the lower end of the blade is longer and blunt tipped so that it aids in cutting the stromal layers without the risk of perforating or lesser risk of perforating the decimates membrane so if you don't have uh, these uh, special uh, um, uh, trocars cannulas you can still use uh, a 26 gauge or a 30 gauge needle also you will have to blunt the tip a little bit you will have to bend it with the bevel facing down uh, and you can use that to get your big bubble so it's not that you need uh, uh, high fund i things but the only uh, drawback of using a needle is because the tip is sharp sometimes you might end up going through and through your cornea so if you're using a blunt tipped uh, cannula that possibility gets uh, reduced as such so preparing the donor corneal button uh, the donor tissue we have to keep in mind to check arcs the age should be less than 80 years post lasik eyes can not be used for dark however we can use it for demec or desec endothelial cell densities of minimum of 1000 cells is required and overall preservation time should be less than 2 weeks in cold storage or uh, split prior to grafting it should be 96 hours and corneal scleral disc excision technique versus whole group enucleation the results have been the same it does not affect the outcome of the surgery preparing the donor corneal button trifination can be performed with any trifine of the surgeon's choice the most crucial aspect would be centration of the transplant on the uh, trifine block there should be no fluid under the tissue so there is no slipping of the trifine process if there is a slipping there is a high chance that it will be an oblique trifination and an oval donor button which will in turn affect the post operative astigmatism Uh, the donor is stored into the medium until the recipient bed is prepared the decimates should not be peeled until the recipient cornea cornea is dissected uh, bearing the dm successfully in event of a macro perforation of the dm where the tear is larger than one quadrant of the cornea we might need to convert to a conventional pk definition of the host cornea it right from insertion of the eyelid speculum it is very important we should make sure that there is no uh, undue pressure on the eyeball decreased positive pressure reduces risks of inducing astigmatism with tight suturing post operatively the size of the trifine should be chosen to adequately encompass the corneal pathology and also to avoid too large a graft in case of dark for uh, keratoconus we use same size donor grafts uh, to relatively lower the myopia and the optical outcomes become better handheld trifine models versus vacuum tri uh, trifines we have already seen the two models and marking the center of the host cornea is also important to adequate the centration of the trifination this is uh, when it is not for dark or when a specific pathology is not there trifination of the host cornea again once the appropriate trifine size is selected and placed on the cornea i get one second further so when you are looking at centering of your trifine you have two basic ways of centering it you have the option of centering it from the limbus so you can measure the limbus and go at uh, Six and a half, or whatever is your cent, uh, ha uh, half thickness of your uh, uh, diameter of your uh, limbal to limbus, and then use that as a centering guide, both horizontally and vertically. You have the option of using the uh, pupil center as a choice for your trifination. So, if you are looking at uh, keratoconus patients, because of the ectasia of your cornea, if you are going to go only by the pupil centration, that will induce a parallax error. So, you would want to. look at both the pupil center and you would want to look at the limbal center you would probably go with the limbal center but again in keratoconus centration depends on the area of your cone so if your cone is decentered 
then your graph has to be slightly decentered or you have to have a larger graph so that you are able to encompass the cone as well as center your uh, graph accordingly so your visual axis is clear so if you have a significantly decentered cone then you might act, and then there's no point in going at just with a 7 to encompass the uh, cone because your sutures are going to come in the visual axis in terms of your uh, pupil in that case you might have to take a larger graph in terms of a 8.59 or 9.5 mm graph so that you are covering the visual axis also as well as and taking care of your uh, ectasia also for all the other etiologies we can actually go with the pupil center also because generally the pupil center will reasonably match your uh, limbal centration unless the pupil is dragged to the periphery for whatever uh, reason say a chemical injury with inflammation and there is a small pass and it is dragged the pupil that's a different situation but otherwise your pupil center in a scar is more or less going to be uh, equal to your uh, limbal centration now yeah, go ahead uh, so once we've centered the trephine we it is rotated in case of uh, using a vacuum assisted we uh, rotated three quarter turns with uh, moderate pressure and we need to remember our uh, pachymetry from the pentacam or the device that we've used then uh, if it is a pentacam based uh, big bubble dal we can up to go up to even 90% of the intended depth in the initial trephination itself the depth of trephination can be checked with our paracentesis blade as we show, we've shown in the picture and care should be taken to avoid excessive pressure otherwise we will go through and through techniques for the dissection of recipient uh, tissue it can either be a manual tissue manual dissection where we go layer by layer it can be microkeratome or uh, motorized uh, automated lam uh, lamellar keratoplasty or it can be femtosecond las uh, laser assisted lamellar keratoplasty so coming to specific techniques of uh, for dissection of the recipient tissue in order to bear the dm it can be air injection technique which was first devised by arkila or it can be the peeling technique hydro delamination uh, melis technique where he used a uh, melis visco dissection technique or it can be a combination of air and uh, fluid or a dye acid uh, which is trypan blue or icg but uh, ideally it, it involves on a case based uh, case by case based and we have to use a combination of all these techniques looking at the evolution of techniques initially barakur had told the deepest level, uh, level of uh, bearing the dm is necessary to avoid any interface scarring and uh, he had a device to barakur's uh, keratome which gave a 300 micron smooth bed then malbran had uh, said we need a maximum depth lk or dark by uh, doing a stromal peeling of technique to get better results in keratoconus patients then this could be achieved by using air injecting one cc of air uh, on a 26 gauge tuberculin syringe above the dm creating a plane and then dissecting with plane spatula and scissors and then this was again uh, used as air lamellar keratoplasty when it was right above the dm uh, sugita and kondo uh, they had told the same thing can be done but by a hydro delaminating uh, technique where saline can be used uh, after the initial trephination and uh, The further dissection can be carried on. Morris had devised instead of saline or air, we can inject visco elastic following the uh, trephination and carrying along with uh, hydro delamination to prevent perforation. Pure limbal paracentesis was also suggested to uh, reduce the bulging of the DM. So when we do a paracentesis with, with a 15 degree blade and a decompression of the anterior chamber is done, that prevents the DM from uh, coming into the cut when we release the air bubble or the visco elastic. Uh, after barren section uh, trephine while we do the uh, dissection by removing the stromal lamella we can uh, do something like a divide and conquer lamellar dissection video of which we'll show later where each quadrant is peeled off right from the center so this gives better uh, visualization uh, when we are dissecting right at the center of the cornea and melis is optical air endothelial interface here he uses the uh, principle of convex mirror where air bubble is in uh, injected into the anterior chamber so that kind of gives a reflex when we are doing the dissection on the cornea within the stromal lamellae and it kind of helps us assess in which depth of the cornea our instrument actually is he also devised a melis dissector for this purpose and another technique which was described is a two step lamellar keratoplasty where initially a 7.5 mm uh, trephination is done and the stroma is dissected the superficial stroma is dissected and the dm is bared if we have achieved that without a perforation then we can proceed to the next uh, circle of 9.5 mm where if there is a risk of uh, perforation or if there is a need for conversion to pk a large graft can be avoided so anwar and tequen came uh, with a big bubble dal which we will be seeing in uh, detail then the manual dissection um, of the anterior stroma also we will be seeing in detail with the uh, videos 
the important point here is to know where the air bubble is whether it is uh, between the dm and the stroma uh, tan and mehta came up with a technique to inject a small air bubble into the ac and this air bubble in the ac will be seen at the periphery because if the air bubble is present between the dm and the stroma it will occupy the center and the air bubble in the ac will be seen in the periphery forming like a donut shaped yeah just one second go back to the slide yeah so basically uh, all these techniques are in a way similar they are using either air or saline to give you visible clues as to how deep you are the deeper you go your instruments go in more smoothly so you are more closer to the dm but your visible clues will be with, with the uh, presence of stromal emphysema or with the hydration of the uh, cornea with saline anvers big bubble was uh, was something which significantly changed so you have out of all these techniques the two techniques which significantly changed the outlook of dalk has been melissus uh, approach where he used air in the anterior chamber and uh, a deeper instrument which is placed in the deep stroma so there is a black band which is seen uh, as an optical illusion which tells you how deep the instrument is close to the to the air that gives you an idea what is the residual stroma so his dissection generally started almost at the limbus and just like how we do a dissect uh, lamellar dissection to prepare the corneal tissue you had a surgeons making a groove at the uh, at the sclera and going deep enough and just like you tunnel your uh, sics uh, uh, tunnels you are going to take it all the way across from almost one limbus to the other then you center your uh, trephine punch and remove the tissue the problem with the melissus technique was especially when you're dealing with keratoconus which has uh, a conical projection when you go from one end to the other you might end up inadvertently perforating the cornea it works reasonably well in terms of dystrophies mucopolysaccharidosis those kind of things because your posterior curvature or your dm is in the same plane so you can follow the uh, curvature and go whereas with keratoconus it becomes a little bit difficult anvers technique gave you a very clear split of the posterior stroma and uh, the uh, duas layer so it gave you a clear plane and once you get a plane you make an entry into that plane uh, you can dissect the tissue very rapidly the only problem was the repeatability of the procedure so not everybody was able to get anvers big bubble not everybody is able to get it even now 100% of the times but there are steps that you can do to increase the percentage of times that you get a big bubble and if you get a big bubble then your surgery becomes faster if you are not getting a big bubble you have to go layer by layer it takes a little bit longer if you get a big bubble your visual outcomes are much better at a faster rate so in a sense at say 6 weeks you get a very good vision the same if you are doing a near desmet dissection also studies have shown that at the end of one year your uh, outcomes with desmetic dalk and a uh, uh, near desmetic dalk is going to be reasonably similar provided you are less than 100 microns from the dm but a desmetic dalk will end up giving you faster visual recovery as compared to a pre desmetic uh, uh, dalk so that is the benefit of anvers uh, technique and his technique of getting a big bubble has significantly revolutionized the way that we do dalk uh, over the last uh, decade and a half go ahead coming to the suturing techniques after the trephination when the graft is sutured the suture tension plays an important role and uh, the depth of suturing where it is 80% on the donor and uh, 90% on the recipient side and the alignment of the anterior surface to prevent epithelial ingrowth plays a major role in the healing process and the post operative astigmatism in case of keratoconus there is a higher chance of wrinkling at the interface because a uh, larger surface is being uh, sutured on by a short or smaller surface and coming to the techniques whether it is a talk anti talk or a single running or a combined suture or a single versus double running or if it's only interrupted suture uh, it did not uh, yield much difference uh, in various studies these studies though were done in penetrating keratoplasties in dalk it did not give uh, results as to which gave the least astigmatism so any type of suturing if the depth of suturing is correct then it is fine the the only thing is uh, with respect to uh, a continuous suturing you can titrate the suture at the end of the procedure to adjust your astigmatism as as best as you can with with, a, with an interrupted suture uh, if you feel that it is not good you have to retake the suture with a continuous you just have to move it here or there uh, but then uh, each person is more comfortable with his or her uh, technique of uh, suturing so some people would be more comfortable with uh, uh, um, interrupted uh, some people are more comfortable with continuous doctor p only does continuous uh, 
sutures for almost all her uh, PKs. Go ahead. So first looking at the manual dissection, uh, where layer by layer uh, dissection is done and where Mellis has used the air endothelial interface, if you look at picture A, the trephining is done in the superficial cornea. We've uh, chosen the manual trephine of the size required. Then in B, a blunt tipped instrument is inserted to identify the deepest plane for corneal dissection. So the tip is inserted here. This superficial corneal lamellae is dissected using a crescent blade. We've got, got the uh, level of dissection, then a crescent blade is inserted and then a dissection is done. The superficial lamella is taken off. Deeper corneal plates are identified carefully. So layer by layer, we create a groove and then we go in with the cutting instrument and then circumferentially excised. So as we go deeper and when we get a clearer interface, then we know that we are closer to the decimate. So the deeper corneal plates are removed layer by layer until a pre-decimatic layer is seen and then the donor can be sutured on. So this is manual dissection. And we, if an air bubble is in, uh, instilled into the anterior chamber, it gives a better reflex to see how deep we are into the corneal stroma. This picture shows the light reflex where the air bubble is in the anterior stroma. And when the dissection ha happens, it kind of gives us how deep we are into the stroma. Now the picture showing us uh, air is injected into it and then air assisted, we can take by manual dissection, layer by layer dissection can be done. The deeper we are, the clearer it gets and gives us a clue that we are closer to the decimates membrane. First trephination is done. Yes. With the needle, when air is injected, we get a stromal emphysema. We are not getting a big bubble. This video is almost like 2003 or 4. Dr. GS was operating. That time, uh, the concept of big bubble and uh, this thing was, was still kind of evolving. So we were uh, doing DALS more with uh, air assisted DALC in terms of getting in. And, uh, uh, understanding of uh, the anatomy because the emphysema gives you a clue as to uh, the presence of residual uh, stromal lamellae. So once and the debulking is done, yeah, you can use the scissors to kind of cut the periphery, and then the idea is to maintain the plane as uh, clearly as possible so that there is no multiple planes that you can. So when you are doing this, you are lifting the tissue up. You're just cutting the tissue bridges with or separating the tissue bridges with your instrument. You don't want to have multiple planes. You just pull the tissue and the, the stromal bridges are that are seen. You are cutting with the with your uh, instrument. So your bed is reasonably smooth. It's not on the till the DM, but it's a reasonably smooth uh, bed and the outcomes are reasonably good as long as you are close to the DM. You can go to the next slide, I think. So in case of a thick corneal scar involving the DM, post infectious keratitis, uh, high drops, dense lipid keratopathy, all these indications layer by layer would give us a better clue as to how deep we can go, where uh, big bubble can have a slight, uh, higher risk of perforation. Appropriate defined size is chosen to encompass as much as the scar tissue and appropriate depth of corneal lamella to be dissected also should be judged. And using a blunt tipped instrument, it can be the surgeon's choice and further deeper and deeper layers are identified until the pre-decimatic layer is reached. Another indication where manual dissection is in already when a decimator seal has happened for, uh, following a perforation. Here first the anterior uh, stromal lamellae are debulked. A 15 degree blade where uh, the anterior chamber air is decompressed. And we already have a plane of dissection here. So the idea here was you have the decimates uh, which is there. So you can easily visualize your plane. You want to debulk the cornea so that the residual tissue that you're cutting is thinner. Debulk it, then make an entry. Make sure that your anterior chamber is uh, soft. So make a paracentesis. Make sure that your when you're working close to the DM, your IOP has to be as low as possible. So keep decompressing the eye. Second, your instrument has to be wet. Even the dry static friction of your instrument can lead to a perforation, especially if it is a keratoconic eye. In, in an eye with a scar like this, your DM is still reasonably strong. But in a keratoconic eye, because it's already stretched, even that little bit of traction from, a, uh, from the static uh, friction of the uh, spatula can lead to a rupture. So once you get a plane, you can, you can cut the remaining tissue on, on, on top of a spatula or you can use manas to... Uh, bear the peripheral uh, area and then you can go ahead with your uh, graft suit.
So the next technique we'll see is fluid lamellar separation or uh, hydro delamination. Well, it is a similar technique. First, the uh, anterior stromal layers are debulked, and instead of using air, we can use uh, saline to debulk the uh, layers till the predesmetic layer is reached. So again, very similar. Your there is a scar due to uh, microvial keratitis in the patient. So you place a trephine, encompassing the scar. Cornea is dissected. The superficial lamella is first taken off, and then with a blunt instrument going towards the deeper layer, fluid is injected, creating a plane, and entering that plane and dissecting till a clearer predesmetic layer or the desmetic layer is barred, and then a donor graft is sutured onto the cornea. The big double technique, there's a type 1 bubble, type 2 bubble. In type 1 bubble, the plane of cleavage is between the stroma and the duas. It is well circumscribed up to 8.5 millimeters or up to where the trephination actually we do. So it gives us a clearer idea for a type 1 bubble. It comes from the uh, center to the periphery. Type 2, the cleavage plane is between the duas and the decimates. It's coming from the periphery to the center and it has a higher risk of perforation of DM. So initial uh, big bubble technique which was uh, described by Anwar, the initial stromal uh, debulking was not described. The As soon as the manual trephination is done, air bubble is in, uh, injected into the posterior stroma and directly there is debulking which is done up to the predesmetic layer. Now widely uh, followed technique is where it is done in two steps. Initially, manual dissection can be done to debulk the anterior few layers of the stroma. So we get a better visualization regarding the depth as to where the 27 gauge needle bevel down is introduced. And then when we inject air, the type of bubble and the level at which it goes can be visualized. So the two step big bubble technique is widely followed now. So here a manual refine is placed. We check the depth with the um, paracentesis blade 15 gauge needle. Then with the crescent, we can do the dissection, debulk the anterior stromal layers. Then with the 27 gauge uh, cannula, we can inject air, achieving the bubble which is needed and then dissect. So basically when you are looking at a big bubble um, thing, there are, uh, we'll come to the indications where we don't want to do a big bubble. So let's first focus on the steps. So your first step is to make fairly deep trephines. So that is why knowing what your peripheral pachymetric value is, is important. So once you're 70 or 80 percent of the depth there, then you can choose to do a debulking first and then follow it up with uh, injection of air or you can inject your air at a deeper plane and then debulk the tissue, then rupture the big bubble and cut the residual uh, tissue. Both ways are, are fine. The tips to get a big bubble is your initial depth of placement of your uh, needle or your cannula has to be deep. It should be paracentral. So you're starting at your trephine margin and going almost close to the pupillary area. You will normally have a 2cc syringe and as you depress, you will tip the needle down. The bevel is supposed to be down. There will be a sudden giveaway or a sudden thing where there will be a sudden uh, a big bubble kind of form thing forming or you will start seeing a stromal emphysema and then suddenly you will see a big bubble which kind of forms. The normal big bubble or a type 1 big bubble will extend only till about 8, 8.5 mm. The idea would be that it should encompass the area of your trephine because if your big bubble goes beyond your area of trephine, then when you puncture it and you cut it, you are you're, you're going to get fairly good vertical edges even at the trephine margin. If your big bubble stops short of your trephine margin, that peripheral edge you will still have to dissect a little bit manually and you might end up causing a small tear or a perforation in that area. If while injecting you feel the big bubble is not expanding beyond say 6 millimeters, then you have to look at decompressing the chamber because there is a pressure difference between the pressure of air in the big bubble and your anterior chamber pressure. So if your anterior chamber pressure is such that it is not allowing the bubble to expand, making a small paracentesis and releasing the aqueous will allow an expansion of the big bubble. And you don't even have to actually inject. Once you do the paracentesis, the pressure of air in the big bubble itself will allow it to expand. It generally doesn't go beyond that 8 mm because of the anatomy of Dua's, Dua's layer. Second, when we were talking about the thickness, the reason why it is important is when you have a very thin cornea, you might or you have certain dystrophies like macular dystrophy, you might actually get a lot more of type 2 bubbles, which is the, the separation between the Dua's and the actual desmets rather than between the posterior stroma and the Dua's. A type 2 bubble uh, is much more flimsier and it is more likely to rupture uh, with even that slightest amount of uh, 
trauma. Uh, the dua's layer is reasonably strong, so you will get away. But the, but if you get a type two bubble, it expands almost till the uh, till the limbus, and it is much more fragile. You might have, you'll have to be a lot more careful that you don't cause an inadvertent rupture of it. Go ahead. There was after by Sima, and somewhere around the fourth second or so, you are actually seeing the bubble start here now, and you can see the bubble grow across almost till the edge of your uh, trifine mark. So, a type one bubble is more white, more opaque. You start seeing this bleb, and then you will you will notice the uh, big bubble start, and there is normally a slight giveaway when it uh, actually starts uh, forming. So this is how a type one bubble happens between the duas layer and the decimates layer. Sorry, type one happens between the duas and the posterior stroma. Posterior type stroma. Two, yeah. So type two happens between the duas and the decimates. This is from uh, YouTube from Tariq Khatamish's video. So after initial trephination, the anterior stroma layers are. So he's trying to check how deep he is. He's going in with a spatch with a with a trocar. Then he's going in with his uh, blunt cannula, going almost close to the center. And there he's uh, injecting the bubble. If you are deep enough, you will get bubble. The stromal emphysema will be lesser. If you are superficial, you will have more of stromal emphysema. Here you can actually see two. There's one glassy bubble and there's one uh, whitish bubble. So he had a a mixed bubble here. Which just marking out the area of your bubble. This is uh, one of our patients, a pediatric uh, patient where uh, with a corneal opacity uh, of unknown etiology, where we first debulked it. We have used the RF uh, trocar and then the uh, 27 gauge cannula, and we have tried to create a bubble. You're seeing a stromal emphysema, and then uh, we'll go back. We'll come back to that uh, subsequently. Then move to the next slide. Yeah. This one is clean. This one is another type uh, one bubble where we have uh, debulked the cornea. Again, we are uh, using the uh, spatula and then the 27 gauge cannula going close to the pupillary area and uh, injecting the uh, air. Sometimes you can have air leak out through this tract. So what is important is uh, if you're using the trocar and the cannula, the trocar is just to initially create a little bit of space. Whereas your cannula actually goes through further deeper. So there is less possibility of the air tracking in through the uh, side of your cannula. If your trocar opening is long and large, then air will keep leaking from the side and you will not get a stable bubble. If you have air leaking in from the side, uh, but you're getting a bubble, but it is collapsing, then you might want to use viscoelastic like helon in the cannula instead of air because then the visco will stay in that place. This is actually uh, Dr. Vinay's video. We had sent it for TNOA long back in 2006. So where uh, initially, if you just go, if you look at it, um, the position of the needle was not ideal. The needle was facing to the side. It was not facing down the, the hub, which uh, might actually have made our life difficult. But uh, we were lucky enough that we got a big bubble at that point of uh, time. Again, the few steps that are important is for placement of the needle, position of the bevel has to be down. And once you get a bubble, the next most important step is to rupture the bubble with adequate confidence to get a space. If you make a very small opening, you might lose the opening. Then again, it becomes difficult to find the same plane to dissect the tissue. So here we had lost the plane. Then we had to we uh, we were lucky enough to get the plane, and then we reached close to the DM and uh, we bared the DM and did the graft. Go ahead next. So what are the contraindications of a big bubble in case of a thin cornea, where again our preoperative pachymetry plays an important role? A decimate level scar in case of uh, scar after hydrops 
or in case of macular dystrophy where the cornea is already thin and when we inject there is a higher chance of rupture of the decimates membrane yeah. so generally it's not like a thin cornea is, is uh, when you have a tear in dm you don't want when you have a macular dystrophy uh, you don't want because uh, you would probably end up with a lot more of type 2 bubbles so it's not that it cannot be done but you have to be careful when you're doing a big bubble in a macular dystrophy okay. a thin cornea is more because if it is very thin in the center uh, there could be a rupture as the air pressure uh, increases. So what are the adverse situations that we can face when there is extensive hemphysema where it is, uh, we do not know whether we've achieved the bubble or there is inability to achieve a big bubble or we get type 1 and type 2 bubbles simultaneously like how we'd seen in the previous video. In case of a micro perforation when there is less than one fourth of the cornea then we can probably use a air or a gas tamponade and proceed with the lamellar keratoplasty. In case of a macro perforation, we have to convert it to a penetrating keratoplasty. In case of a double anterior chamber after surgery, it usually resolves spontaneously. So it, again, here it depends. If you have had a perforation, then it will resolve. If you have a suture tract leak, which is caused a second chamber, then uh, it might settle down uh, spontaneously. So this is a picture which is showing us extensive emphysema where uh, it is very difficult to achieve a big bubble. In that case, we'll have to pro proceed with manual, uh, manual layer by layer lamellar dissection. Again, in case of type 1 and type 2 bubble, we'll have to identify whether there is a central bubble present by injecting an air into the uh, air bubble into the anterior chamber. Because there is a central bubble present, this anterior chamber air takes a say of shape of a sausage. Only in the periphery, we will be able to see as it is shown here in the figure number F. In the periphery, we will see a sausage shape. There, then we know that a uh, big bubble is present. Basically, a double bubble helps us to identify if you have a stromal emphysema and you are not sure that you've got a big bubble or it's only stromal emphysema, presence of uh, inability of the air to enter into the central corneal uh, central chamber tells you that that area, this, the, the DM is pushed down and that will happen only if there is a uh, a big bubble which is uh, which is formed. This is a schematic diagram to uh, understand how that happens. When the big bubble is present above the decimates, when we inject air into the anterior chamber, it is more in the periphery where, because the center is taken up by the big bubble, we will be able to see it as a sausage shape here in the periphery. When now this area is cut open to dissect the uh, lamellar tissue, when the air is released, then this bubble moves to the center. You can see here, you hardly have any emphysema, you, you directly get a big bubble. All that is possible if you are deep enough to begin with. So we decompress the anterior chamber here. And he's pushed in viscoelastic to push it back. He's separated the anterior uh, stroma uh, like a four uh, quadrant divide and conquer uh, stuff. Right from a good block, using uh, the correct speculum, refination of the host, bearing the DM near DM, refination of the donor and suturing. So it is important to mark the pathology, center the trephine, mark the center of the cornea. So this is to send to make sure that you are centered on your central axis and then you remove that and put your guarded refine and then you rotate uh, it you can be fairly bold enough in rotating because you know you will not go uh, below the i mean more than the 3 300 microns that uh, you are intending to do this is yeah the other thing is when you are looking at uh, dalk and you want to uh, you have an eye with an arcus kind of a thing uh, you can use uh, the uh, artificial chamber to actually refine the cornea from the epithelial side also. So you can use the same, say a 7 mm on the on the recipient and a 7 mm on the on the uh, donor cornea mounted on an artificial chamber. So as in eyes which you have a dense arcus, you don't want to slip because it is held in the artificial anterior chamber. You can be much more uh, centered and uh, use the graft. Your matching when you're cutting both from the anterior surface is going to be better. And if you're going to be cutting both from the anterior surface, then you need to use the same size trifle. So it will be a 7-7. Seven, seven. Unlike when you're using an anterior and a posterior cut, in a, like in a normal situation where you use a 7 for the recipient and a 7.5 for the donor. Here you're going to be using the same size uh, trifle. And also because this doesn't hit the Teflon block, 
so the trifying sharpness is also maintained for a longer period of time if you uh, use this method of uh, trifining yeah go ahead next going through the entire procedure the flinger ring is first placed center of the cornea is marked the pathological area is marked centering centering the trifine on the recipient superficial lamella was dissected and removed we using the uh, trocar to gain uh, a little bit of an access and then using the uh, 27 gauge cannula to go deep towards the center i was a bit superficial so it took a little bit of time we've gone towards the center we've tried to uh, inject air you can see the bubble start forming so we, we have gone beyond our refined margin so once you reach that you are you are fairly comfortable that uh, you are okay with the size of your big bubble you don't want to keep injecting more air because sometimes it can rupture uh, into the anterior chamber then you use your uh, 15 degree knife to cut the bubble to allow it to escape so when you are making that entry uh, sometimes it's difficult because you make you are so worried about it rupture going through and through that your neck becomes small and then it becomes difficult because then you are it's difficult for you to find the correct pin here the neck was small so it took us some time to it stop the video stopped again yeah it took us some time to again find the plane and once we uh, reach the plane again uh, use uh, using uh, a bit of visible uh, clues we were able to then wear the dm and cut the remaining uh, stroma using uh, uh, scissors so one of the tips that uh, is given is you need to know where you have made the entry so you can mark your uh, instrument with a marking pen so that point will always be visible second is you can use helon on the area that you are going to make the entry in so that the escape of air gets tamponaded a little bit so your air will not collapse as fast so your dm is protected third is instead of using a 15 degree knife which goes in vertically and the sharpest point uh, sharpest point in terms of the tip points down you can actually use a keratome kind of a thing or an angled mbr that we use because then when you are making an entry you are actually making an entry parallel to the dm so the possibility of rupturing the dm by making an incision becomes lesser also the entry with the keratome is a little bit larger than the entry with a 15 number blade so you, the uh, ability to spot it find it and go into that place and inject the helon to push the dm back is a lot easier i think this you can go forward that other video next video is the one with uh, the technique that we can show this is from dr foglas so once you have uh, dissected the anterior uh, lamella you made see the entry point in terms of only the the trocar is only going a small distance it's just creating a space for for your uh, final uh, spatula to go in once the spatula is in you've got a fairly good big bubble you're decompressing the chamber making sure that you want to uh, want the bubble to reach to the periphery you're putting in helon on the surface and then you're using a keratome to make an entry so this entry is more or less parallel to the dm so your uh, risk of hitting the dm becomes lesser once that plane is created you can inject helon to push the dm back and then you can use uh, vana scissors to cut the uh, tissue into four quadrants during all this phase it is important to maintain your uh, uh, keep decompressing your anterior chamber to make sure that your iop is very very low this much is the thing you go to the next video because this is the idea was just to show the opening of the bubble so this is just a animated video uh, i mean again a video where you can use uh, femtosecond assisted so again the idea of using a femto assisted uh, a uh, big bubble is basically to get you a much more contoured graft in terms of a top hat or a mushroom 
and you can you can be more precise with respect to femtosecond laser in terms of your depth of trephination as compared to just a standard uh, trephine which is going to be giving it at uh, 50 microns here even 10 or 20 microns you can adjust the depth once you are deep enough uh, you can get your big bubble and then the anterior portion gets uh, gets removed uh, fairly easily So the idea of using fifty second here is only for a very good shape in terms of a mushroom or a uh, or a top hat uh, configuration. Otherwise, uh, the technique is similar because you still have to get your big bubble. A fifty second cannot be used in a keratoconic cornea at to cut it deep because it is going to follow the contour of your anterior cornea. It's not going to follow the contour of your uh, uh, desmets membrane. And in keratoconus, there is a thickness issue between the center and the periphery. So if you measure all the value from the depth from the center it is going to cut deeper in the center it is going to cut lesser in the periphery so your um, topography is still not going to be as good as you get if you are able to get a big bubble so for the donor you can do a top hat you can then peel off the uh, endothelium for the recipient you do the top hat you open up the bridges and then you can uh, inject air to get a deeper plane and uh, rupture the bubble to bear the desmets so he's just removing the superficial uh, lamellae that is there because with femto second what is cut is only the edge the bed you are not cutting using a 27 gauge cannula now with a with an opening or a bevel down the bevel is down you are holding the tissue going you are creating the space space with your trocar so it's just a little bit of of rocking movement to create a little bit of space and then the needle uh, the cannula goes in straight further towards the center if your initial uh, gap is too much then the air will keep leaking from the side so you have taken it almost to the center again coming then fine otherwise i think the next is just to, it's similar to all the other big bubbles that have been formed it's not moving fine i think we can we can mean the basic idea was yeah so you're getting a big bubble which is there and then you cut up on the tissue you can proceed next So the complications of dull can be failure to separate. Failure to separate the decimates or the uh, posterior decimates layer by air or viscoelastic. So repeated attempts or eventually manual dissection will be needed. If there is an intrastromal bubble with viscoelastic technique, which will mimic a type one big bubble. Again, we need to be careful. Sometimes intraoperative OCT might be helpful. Perforation or bursting. Again, uh, depending on whether it's a micro perforation or macro perforation, it has to be managed. Double anterior chamber, as we discussed. Uh, interface wrinkling, early looser, uh, early suture loosening, or interface vascularization and graft rejection. These so are again, some of the. Yeah. So again, if you have looking at rejection. or you looking at early suture vascularizing that's going to be more in terms of patients with uh, either chemical injuries or patients with vkc with keratoconus where there's an active inflammation where your sutures get loose if you're looking at an adult keratoconus patients generally they behave fairly well if you have a perforation when you initially trephine you can suture that area and reinitiate manual dissection from a different area if you have a perforation you'd leave that for the last dissect everywhere and then come to that uh, area you leave a small air bubble to create or seal that uh, opening uh, as such you can use a peeling technique where you can keep 
deepening the groove in the periphery and once you are reasonably deep and you see a clear area you can hold it and peel off the tissue the deeper you are once you tend to peel it will peel off in in uh, a normal uh, fashion because it's at that at that when you are at a deeper level when you are just pulling the tissue it is going to separate at the same collagen uh, plane so when you are in the same plane your interface is not going to be uh, hazy as such yeah go ahead next some of the clinical indications where we've done dark insferoidal degeneration uh, macular dystrophy not showing not showing the video is not moving yeah go back go back insferoidal degeneration in macular dystrophy keratoconus you are in post classic uh, ectasia and even in thermal injury post infective scar so the the next part would be basically on approach when we would do uh, altk uh, approach would be in terms of combining dalk with other procedures dalk with cataract dalk with chemical injuries dalk with infections the indications and how you would uh, proceed in those uh, situations uh, patch grafts using uh, dalk in terms of uh, perforations those things will be covered in the next uh, class